And this is what is prompting Moses to make the request he's making because he knows what God has told him. This is his unique personal promise from God. Now, so he, you see how he started. So in verse 13, he now makes his request. He now brings forward his prayer petition. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I found grace in your sight according to what you said, show me your way that I may know thee and that I may find grace in your sight. In other words, in the Hebrew, it actually means that I might keep finding grace in your sight so I don't ever fall out of grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. Look at God's response. Instantaneous response. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I'll give thee rest. That's God's response. Church, listen to me. God is not a complicated God. He's not complicated. He's not a difficult God. Trust me, honestly, believe me. God is not the one that you have to twist his arm to get something from him. Some people, I tell you, when they want to give you, do you a favor. You have to keep calling them, calling them, calling them, begging them. They probably want you to uh, uh, adore them. They want you to affirm them. They want you to honor them. They want you to praise them. They want you, for want of a better word, to worship them. Before they eventually give you this. Many of us, we, think, we seem to think again that God is that kind of person that you have to persuade and persuade and persuade and probably um, twist him and then he now gives you. And many of us think that, well, God is not that easy. You have to do a lot of hard work, fast, 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 uh, pray, inconvenience yourself, have night vigils, then God answers you. Have you seen? Have you seen how Moses interacted with God the Father? He prayed that prayer just in almost, he didn't go beyond those words. God answered him. So I want us to cultivate this practice of conversation with God. When you talk to God, tell him what you want, and then keep quiet. Keep quiet and wait for his response. You're not talking to an inanimate object. You're talking to a person who can talk as well, who has the ability to hear what you're saying. So when you converse with God, well, first of all, remind him of his promise. Remind him of what he has said. Then bring your petition. And when you brought your petition, just keep quiet and wait for his response. Am I making sense, church? All right. That's not even where, this is not even what my message is. Then, Moses went further. Listen to what Moses said. Moses went further to say, he said, your presence will make us distinct. In other words, God, listen to, watch, watch this. Let me show you something. The church, let me show you. I just discovered this the other day. Do you want to see? Let me show you something. Um, okay. Do you see here? Do you see here? Here. Do you see what I'm showing you here? It says, Thou has not let me know whom thou will send with me. That's, he's referring to himself. Now, I, he's with God. He's directly with God. He, he's talking about himself. Eh? He's talking about himself. Whom thou will send with me. That is, I'm the leader of this place. Who is going to help me? Who is going to go with me on this assignment, this journey? And God says, my presence will go with you and I will give the rest. Okay, fine. But that is not all. If thy presence, go, look at verse 15. Presence, go not with me. Carry us not up hence. What's happening here? He's saying here, if thy presence go not. Eh? Can you see this in with me? It's actually in italic. It wasn't there in the original 
manuscript. So what he's simply saying is, if your presence does not go with us, carry us not up hence. In other words, Moses, listen to Richard, listen. Moses is praying here. It's not a question of you going with me. It's not me. I don't want your presence around me. What I want your presence is with all of us. Every one of us. I want your presence enveloping the entire nation. This man, this Moses, he, the guy is too much. He just too much. His heart is awesome. So he's saying here, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us. I don't want it to be that you will say your presence is going with me, Moses. I am interceding for everybody. So if you're not going with us, then don't go, don't, don't take us. Just then look at what it is to tell you that he's referring to the presence of God mingling with everybody. Look at what it says in verse 16. Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people, can you see what it's saying there? Now it is plural. I and thy people. I and thy people have found grace in your sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us? Let me put this in an NIV and you see a more interesting, something more interesting. Okay, look at it in NIV. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people? Me. So it's not just me. I don't want God. God, I don't want it to be that you're just coming with me. Come, let your presence envelop me as well as envelop everybody. And when that happens, what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? The point I'm making here is this. Moses is praying for God's presence in the midst of the entire Israelites. In other words, listen to me carefully. Moses knows very clearly he is wise, he's exposed, and he knows without any air of doubt from his experience that it is God's presence in their midst that will make them distinct. Church, listen to me. In our lives today, you need the presence of God. Moses knew that they cannot accomplish this um, journey into the promised land without the presence of God. He knew that they would run into problems. He knew that they are going to be very, very vulnerable to the adversaries on the way, the challenges, the difficulties, the temptations, the snares. He knew, he knew very well. And he was sensible enough to insist on God's presence before he proceeded. Because if he had proceeded without ensuring God's presence, let me tell you, that is recipe for failure. Now, I want you to determine also that your divine assignment in this world, your destiny in this world, your success in this world, your victorious living in this world cannot be achieved without God's manifest presence. I'm not talking about his passive presence that I know that Christ is inside of us, but it's, you see, you see when my wife was singing today, there was so much anointing, I could feel the flames, I could feel my heart burning with the presence of god that kind of presence we want god's manifest domineering dominating prominent preeminent presence because that is what is going to make the difference that's what's going to make the difference <laughs> what is it that distinguished the israelites listen to me what made them distinct and distinguished? What made them different? What made them, what's the word? Um, you know, when, when people revere you, 
when people fear you, when people, you know, respect you. What's that word? Give me a word. Someone can give me the word. What made them highly respected and even revered and feared? It's not their land. They didn't even have any land. They didn't have any land at this time. It's not their wealth. They didn't really have any wealth that anybody would be envious of. It's not their culture. They hadn't even developed any culture. These people are where they're, they're coming from um, almost a stateless, nationless background. It's not their righteousness. These people had just bowed down to a cow, so they don't have any righteousness. So what is it that made them distinct? Is it education? They don't have education. It's not their smartness, it's not their skills, it's not their gifts. It was simply because they had a relationship with God. And that relationship was such that it's not a religious relationship. It's a living relationship whereby God was in their presence. What will make you distinct and distinguished as a believer, different from others, is your relationship with God. Not religious, legalistic relationship, but a living relationship whereby God has, Christ has taken the place of preeminence in your life and he is living in you. Not I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. I'm telling you the truth. You cannot achieve any kind of grounded, successful distinction and excellence in this world without him. Yesterday, yesterday, my wife and I were watching the TV and we saw one guy called Arukel. Sorry, I'm very, very, very illiterate and ignorant when it comes to all these entertainment news and all that but this guy i saw that he had been sentenced he's likely going to be sentenced to a minimum of 11 of of of, of, um, of 15 years imprisonment why because there may be coming up with accusations of um, child abuse or abuse sexual abuse racketeering and all that but my wife was now telling me that this guy started from church they started from church and then somehow he veered off. And that my wife was telling me, I don't know, I don't know this is, I don't, I don't read all this is, I don't read them, but <laughs> I'm informed by my wife. And she says that this guy was so, so, so popular, popular, so popular that you, in fact, but guess what? This man, despite his popularity, where is he going to end up in? In prison. Listen to me. Moses knew that this was going to happen to the Israelites. That yes, all these things, all this glory that people have know, known about them is because of God's presence. If God's presence leaves them, then they're going to be in big trouble. They, he knows that they will get to a climax and they will come to begin to experience anticlimax. So, church, what is it? that will make you different, distinct, and successful in a guaranteed manner. Not the success that will come today, tomorrow, is lost, then it comes back again. No. That permanent, consistent, victorious living, it is God's presence. So you say, okay, Robert, this presence, is God not with me? Yes, God is with you. But the kind of presence I'm talking about is where his presence becomes preeminent in your life. Where Galatians 2.21 can be said to be real in, in your life. Where, like you say, I, I, Robert, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The person living in me is Christ that lives in me. So the presence of Christ in me comes to the fore. The presence of Christ in me is active. The presence of Christ in me is accorded preeminence and prominence so that he is the one. Because you see, let me tell you how the presence of God manifested in the time of the Israelites. How it manifested. See, God told 
Moses to build a tent for him. So that tent is called Moses' um, tabernacle, but it's actually God's tent. It's actually God that resides there. God gave him the dimensions and all that. So what happens is that God came and tabernacled with them in that tent. And he, God did not just reside there in the heavens and say, okay, I'm sending my people. No, no. He came down from his heavens and came and pitched his tent with them. He had his tabernacle. He had his temple. He, he, was, he was inside there. That's where Moses used to go and come in with him. Now, when it is time for them to move, God comes out of his tent in the form of a pillar of cloud. And then he begins to move. Everybody packs their bag and baggage and they begin to follow him. Wherever the semblance of God in the form of a pillar of cloud or fire, wherever he settles, everybody settles. So the glory of that cloud, it extends over the entire camp. It extends over the entire camp. That glory is the assurance that no nation, no power, no kingdom can ever touch them. <laughs> when you see a group of people, you can't explain the kind of cloud over them. Who are you to go and attempt to touch them? People were running afraid, people were afraid of them. So this is the same thing I'm saying. We want that kind of Shekinah glory to find active manifestations and expression all around us. I know many people say, Pastor, please, I appreciate what you say. Tell me how this can be possible. How can I do it? How can I do it so that when I when I when I, when I go about my normal duties, that Shekinah glory is with me? Ask my wife. When I was cutting her, I would drive from my town to her town. It takes about three hours or so. I'm just praying the spirit. I'm engaging with Christ. When I come into her living room. Well, her parents' house. When I come in there, according to her, I never saw it, but according to her, she sees what she says again, so like hollow, like flames over my head. I have a feeling that was that's part of one of the things that made her to say yes to my request. Because I was going about with the glory of God. See, it doesn't have to be seen in that physical state, but it can be seen in the way things happen around you, things happen in you, things happen for you, whereby you, because you are inside that glory, no weapon fashioned against you can prosper. Whatever you set out your hand to do flourishes. The wisdom of God is guiding you. The glory of God is guiding you. The, the, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the peace of God, the success of heaven. Everything is about you is just unique and different. You are not subject to the whims and caprices of the wicked one of this world. You're on a different pedestal. Your dwelling place is in the heavens with Christ, where no wickedness can touch you. You are like wind that can no, never be trapped. That is because God's presence is with you listen to me what distinguishes you is God's presence. you see some of us today eh? when people are relying on now the, the people want they want success in their marriage or their children or in their career so people are looking for methods to succeed some people are looking for I call it the three m's methods money and media so some people are looking, they think that by, if they, oh, if I get a lot of money, then I can secure my life and live successfully and victoriously and all that. Some people think, oh, social media or media or whatever. If I use media, I can gain all the fame and reputation I need. All those things are good. I'm not saying they are not, they're, they're, there's nothing, anything bad in them. Nothing bad in them, but please rely on God's mighty presence to accomplish anything that you set out, any assignment before you. You need, we need God's presence. We just need his presence, his manifest presence. We need to cultivate it. You know, 
And to, for whatever impact you want to make in this world, you want to make disciples, you want to care for the less privileged, you want to minister to the needy, you want to even parent your children, you want to be a godly wife or a godly husband, anything, you need the presence of God. You need his enablement. You need his empowerment. You need that living relationship where he's supplying you. He supplies you with his life. He supplies you with his essence. He supplies you with his wisdom, with his counsel, with his power, with, his, with resources that meet your needs. So don't attempt to do life in the absence of God's presence and God's power. Don't attempt to do like that. Because if you attempt to do stuff, you will discover that life will just become mechanical and mundane for you. If you attempt to do your marriage, your ministry, your career, and you're doing it with your own wisdom, your strength, your ability, you know, you're just running. Running, you're just running, you know, running that treadmill or running that track of life. And you have not deliberately ensured that you are running with God's presence and God's power. Let me tell you what will happen. After a while, you discover that you've run out of strength. You are ground. You know, you say something is grounded. You say you, you some people they drive a car. They drive a car. They don't care maintaining it. They don't care and all that. Then once one day the car just refuses to to move, so they've driven it uh, to the point of grounding it. You know. So I want to encourage us, please. God's presence is important. Time has gone. Um, I'm just going to see how much we can do in the next couple of minutes.